In our message today, we are going to be talking about Mary's response to the amazing words of the angel when he had told her, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. And her response is called the Magnificat. It's the Song of Mary, which Christians have studied for centuries. And today, we're going to see how we can magnify God with our lives. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Last week, as we launched this message series, The Gospel of Luke, Investigating Jesus, we had the chance to dive into why Luke wrote this gospel in the first place. And it's the fact is, is that there were a lot of accounts of Jesus' life, both verbal and written, by the time that Luke wrote this around AD 60. And so Luke just wanted to, to clear up some questions. I mean, he had questions about Jesus. Theophilus, the one he was writing to, had questions about Jesus, and many others did too. And so Luke, being the doctor and being well-versed in research, went ahead and carefully investigated everything from the beginning. In other words, he was able to interview eyewitnesses and get a chance to talk to different people. And he really compiled not just the account of Jesus, but the impact that Jesus had on his disciples in two books that we have recorded in the scriptures. And the first is the Gospel of Luke, and the sequel then is the Book of Acts. And that's where we find out where Luke even began to, to come to find out who Jesus is, because he became acquainted with the teachings of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul then was the one who actually had Luke as his traveling companion on some of his missionary journeys. Well, we find out that in as Luke writes the gospel, that he really introduces us to two key people who had sons who were influential within salvation history. The, the first is Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, and then we find Mary herself also being visited by the angel Gabriel. And next week, we're going to talk about what occurred with Zechariah after he doubted and he just wasn't sure if God really could make good on his promise. We're going to see the rest of the story of that in next week's message as we study the Song of Zechariah. But this week, we're going to take a look at the Song of Mary. And in church history, it's often called the Magnificat. And that's just Latin for magnify, and we're going to see what that means in just a moment. And so the big question that we really want to be asking ourselves is this today. How can I magnify God when I don't fully understand what he's doing? So how can I magnify God when I don't fully understand? Well, the reason why that's such a big question is because think about Mary's position that the, the angel Gabriel comes from God and tells her, hey, Mary, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. And of course, she asks the question, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And his answer is that the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to make it possible because no word from God will ever fail. Then Mary gives this beautiful response of faith just simply by saying, may your word to me be fulfilled. And so even though she didn't understand entirely what was going on, she trusted who God is. And she is the one who just in this account here gives us a beautiful way of how we can magnify God, even when we don't always fully understand everything that he's up to in our lives. And so here's where we're going to dive in. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 1, verse 39. It says, At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now, why did Mary go to visit Elizabeth? Well, 
Remember that as we had studied last week in Luke chapter 1, that the angel, as he was telling Mary about this amazing miracle that she was going to give birth to the Son of God, that the angel says, even now, your relative Elizabeth is in her sixth month. And mind you, Mary knew that her cousin Elizabeth was very old and beyond the years of, of being able to have a child. And so this was a miracle. And that's what motivated her then to make the trip. Now, what I want to show you is a picture of the map of the journey from Nazareth, where Mary was, to the hill country of Judea, where Elizabeth lived. And you don't have the, like, the mileage key on the map, but most experts will tell you, depending on where Elizabeth lived in the hill country of Judea, that this trip could have been anywhere from 80 to 100 miles. Now, mind you, Mary didn't have a bus, she didn't have a car, she didn't have a train, she didn't have any of this, she didn't have uh, an airplane, she didn't have any of those things, and so most likely, she just simply traveled this by foot. Now, why all the effort? Why the effort to go to visit Elizabeth? Well, understand that for Mary to be an unwedded, pregnant woman at the time, that that would have ruined her life socially, that would have ruined her life relationally, that her reputation would have gone down the drain. Because just imagine how the conversation would have gone. Yeah, that's right. I am I am betrothed to Joseph, but I'm not married to him yet, and, and it's, he's not the dad. God is. That God the Holy Spirit is the one who made this possible. Just imagine how that conversation would go, even with her mom and dad. I'm sure they were like, mm-hmm, sure, right? And so Mary made this trip because she needed to go to someone who the angel had name-dropped Elizabeth, for one thing, and secondly, she needed to go to someone who would be sympathetic in her situation. And I think that's the value of Christian community, isn't it? And so when we are asking this question of how can I magnify God when I don't understand, the first thing that we can do is, and here's our first fill-in, find your authentic Christian community. Find people that are going to be sympathetic to your situation. Not that they will necessarily, I mean, if there's wrongdoing in your life, not that they're just going to say, hey, it's okay, you can do whatever you want. No, but find a community where you can be real. Find a community where you can be yourself, where you can be authentic and genuine and, and actually truly vulnerable with the struggles that you have. And that's what Mary found with Elizabeth. She found someone who was willing to listen, someone who was willing to love her, someone who was willing to support her and encourage her and remind her of the promises of God. And that was something that was incredibly important for Mary. It's something that's incredibly important for you and me as 21st century followers of Christ. And that's, that's the reason why here at Crosswalk, we've got so many of those types of authentic communities. I mean, chief in mind comes uh, the resilient ministry that we have here at Crosswalk where we have people with all different things going on in their life, hurts, habits, hang-ups, all the things that will sometimes cause them to stumble in their faith. And, and yet in resilient ministry, we find a place where we can rest in Jesus, a place where we can be real about the struggles, and we can receive that support and encouragement from one another. Another ministry that comes to mind would be our grief share ministry that we have so many people within our community and especially here at Crosswalk who have lost loved ones over the years, that have experienced the pain of having to say goodbye to someone who's died. And, and especially at this time of the year, that is extremely difficult. And in fact, just this afternoon, I'm gonna be going and spending some time with someone who is struggling with this, uh, grieving the loss of, of his mother. And so just understand, that we have authentic Christian communities that are meant to be a support system for us. When we don't always understand what God is up to, they can point us back to the words and promises of our gracious God, which is what we see Elizabeth do here. So when Mary goes through the, the door, look at what happens next. Look at verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But 
Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So it's pretty cool that as Mary stepped through the doorway and greeted Elizabeth, that Elizabeth felt this jolt inside her belly, and that was uh, baby John, baby John the Baptist, that, that John was leaping in her womb. Now, my wife and I have had the, the blessing of having four boys over the years, and I've always had that privilege of putting my hand on my wife's belly and just kind of feeling the, the baby roll around in there and, and, you know, like push back sometimes and everything. I can't imagine what Elizabeth must have experienced with John doing a little jump for joy in, in her womb. That had to be incredible. But the Holy Spirit didn't leave her wondering what this was all about. We, we find that the Holy Spirit must have revealed to Elizabeth who Mary is and what that baby is that's inside Mary. That the, the Holy Spirit let her in on this whole scenario. And that's another thing too, is that, that God doesn't want us to be in the dark. He doesn't want us to be left wondering what he's up to. He gives us this book. He gives us the eyewitness accounts that Luke recorded in this book for us to be certain of what God is up to in our lives. And we see that evident here that then Elizabeth just praises God and praises that little baby inside of Mary. It is an absolute miracle. And I think this is the thing that there is incredible value in our Christian community, that sometimes when we don't understand what God is up to, our Christian community can point us back to who God is that he can make the impossible possible, that he is the one who is creating a miracle, both inside of Elizabeth, giving her a baby in her old age, and the son of God being born into time that was growing in, this, in the womb of Mary. It is a miracle, and that is the thing. Our God is a God of miracles. And for our Christian community, like Elizabeth, to be able to bless Mary and to remind Mary of who that is, that is that that's the Lord inside your womb, just in case you've forgotten. So also our Christian community can remind us of who God is when we wonder what he's up to. Now, what's interesting is that Mary's gonna launch into a song here in, in just a second. And in my opinion, this is the first and the greatest of Christmas songs. And as you heard me before say, it's the Magnificat because she's magnifying the Lord. But I want you to think about some of your favorite Christmas songs that you have. Maybe it's Joy to the World, Silent Night, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Maybe it's more of the oldies but goodies of the, you know, the songs of We Wish You a Merry Christmas and, you know, Chestnuts Roasting Over an Open Fire. Like just all these songs that, that come to mind that we love about this time of the season. But again, in my opinion, this is the best one. And this is the original. This one was written way long before the ones that we enjoy now. And so here's what Mary sang in response to all of the amazing promises of God. Luke 1 verse 46, it says, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him, from generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, I'm, I'm going to co go back and refer back to some of these verses, but what is important to see is that Mary obviously knew her Old Testament. 
that she had listened well to her parents as they sang some of the psalms because there are actually a number of phrases from the psalms that she has in this song. And what that does for us is it reminds us that, you know what, it, our God is born in time and as a God who is in control over all time, he's in control of keeping his promises, which is exactly what Mary's saying about here. And so the, the question that I think is important for us as we think, how can I magnify God? Maybe let's rephrase it just a little bit differently. And, and the question is, what moves me from questioning God to magnifying God? You just think about it. We, we often question. In fact, that was the very reason why Luke was writing this, is that we wonder what he's up to. We wonder if he's ever going to answer our prayers. We wonder sometimes why he answers our prayers the way he does, like he did with Zechariah. And of course, at that point, Zechariah questioned God, and we're going to talk more about that next week. So how do I move from questioning to magnifying? Well, what we can learn from Mary here is the answer is this. Look at how great God is. Look at how great God is. That throughout all generations, he's merciful. That he is humble, or not humble, but that he is mindful of the humble state of his servants. That he's mindful of you. That he knows what's going on in your life and he loves you anyway. That he sees the good and the bad and the downright ugly of your life and he loves you anyway. And that is what Mary is just simply marveling at. You look back at, at verse 48 again, and it says, For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. You know, I got into a little bit of a discussion um, with one of my, my fellow pastor buddies. He's a, a missionary in the world mission field. And so we talked about, you know, what, what did Mary mean exactly about the humble state of his servant? Does that mean that she was talking about how poor she is? Because she was from a poor family. Does it mean that, you know, she was just an extra humble person and that she was thinking like, who am I to, to have God intervene? Maybe. But maybe even more so is the thought of, the fact that there actually really is no reason why God should pay attention to any of us because of our sinfulness. That we truly are indebted to God. That I, when I think about all of my thoughts, words, and actions that don't line up to God's, um, God's will for my life, that's a humble state. That I am in complete debt that I could never pay off. And yet, what does it say here? God is merciful. And so here's our, our next fill in as we think about how can we magnify God. Well, we can magnify God by remembering that God is mindful to me and merciful to me. That he's mindful and merciful. That he's mindful that he listens to you. So whatever's on your heart and mind, whatever you're struggling with in life and, and whatever you may be stressing about, because I don't know if you're anything like me, but there's a lot of deadlines at this time of the year. You gotta get the Christmas cards out. You gotta get the party planned. You've gotta be able to make sure everybody knows where to be and when to be and all this. And there's a lot of deadlines in work as well as we get to year end in business world. And it's a struggle sometimes. What we wanna know is that based on what Mary's saying here, God is mindful. That he pays attention to you and cares for you. Everything that you're going through, he knows. And he's merciful, which means that that word just simply means he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. And the reason why is because that little baby growing inside of Mary would one day go to a cross and there he would pay the price. You see, mercy always comes at a price. Someone has to pay. And in our case, Jesus did. He paid the price for our forgiveness. And now, when you look at, at verse 51, um, it continues here in, in Mary's song. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. 
He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, it doesn't take an English major to notice that Mary's speaking in the past tense here, even though these things haven't happened yet, according to the, the baby that's inside of her womb, that he's still growing in there. He hasn't done any of these things. And it's fitting to note that certainly God had done mighty things for his people in the past. I mean, think about probably the biggest one that they would have thought about would be the way God brought his people out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land of Canaan. And certainly God did mighty things. But the mightiest of all is what would yet happen through the life and work of Jesus as our Savior. And so here's our next fill-in then, too, as we think about how can I magnify God? Well, again, remember that God uses his might to do what is right. And history proves it. You see, you and I get to look back now on this account. And again, remember that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are just simply four different accounts at the life of Jesus that gives us like an instant replay that we can check all the different camera angles on, on Jesus' life, that the history that we have in this book proves it. And if that's not enough, I mean, if you're still skeptical and still questioning God, do you realize that there's like over 30 other historical documents written by like, I don't know, 25 different people, most of whom were enemies of Christianity, who also point out to the fact and testify that the fact that Jesus is real, that he was a real guy who actually lived in first century um, AD and that you know, there was a death, that there was uh, an account of a resurrection and all of these things that, but you and I as Christians, we have what we need here. The history that God gives us here proves us that he uses his might to do what is right. Sometimes as we reflect on this and we remind ourselves, that's right, he, he has brought down rulers. He does scatter those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Sometimes I need to be humbled. Sometimes I need to have people speak into my life and point out my blind spots, point out my sins, call me out on my misdeeds to humble me because then I can fully appreciate who God is and what he has done for me. Now, in closing then, just the final uh, verse of this section that we're going to look at today it says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Now, of course, during that time then, basically, she has completed her first trimester by the time that she goes home. So there's a good chance that she was maybe starting to have a little bit of a baby bump by the time she, she went back to Nazareth. And we're not told if she actually stuck around for the birth of John the Baptist. But remember, when Mary arrived at Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth was already six months along. So Mary may have left just before John the Baptist was born. We, we really don't know. And, and Luke didn't care to, to point out those details. But I think what is important is that Mary enjoyed that authentic Christian community with Elizabeth. She spent time. They rejoiced in God together and lifted each other up and built each other up. And so here's the thing, I think, uh, the final thing that we can learn from these two amazing women that were a part of God's salvation story. And the final thing is, and the question I think as we conclude here is this, how do I, how do I magnify God in my life? Just in my daily life, how do I magnify God? And I think what we can learn from the two of them, from both Elizabeth and from Mary, is that we want to let the who motivate the how. When we think about how great our God is, we're led to praise him. When we think about how loving our God is, we're led to pray to him. When we think about how just God is and how he's mindful of our humble state and he's aware of all the wrongdoing that we are guilty of, we are led to confess. So to pray, to praise, to confess, to enjoy Christian community, to be in that authentic Christian, Christian community, these are all the lessons that we have in how we can magnify our God by focusing on the who he is. And that in turn will motivate us in how we live as we strive to bring glory to the one 
who has saved us from our sins. And then just uh, one final, maybe one final illustration. I want, to, I want you to take a look at this picture. This, this picture is of a, a prism and you have the light source coming in and as it goes through, it scatters into the, the beautiful rainbow. And what that reminds us is that Christian community, in a lot of ways, is like that prism, that we have this light source from God, that he gives us his words and promises, and that as we spend time together, as we spend time remembering, as we spend time encouraging, as we spend time praying and praising and worshiping our God for who he is, you know what happens? Is that all of the wonderful colors of who God is is displayed to the people around us. This Christmas season, my friends, remember who God is and that let that motivate how you live. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for these amazing words that Luke recorded. He had the privilege of, of investigating and, and perhaps even interviewing Elizabeth and Mary and just asking them about this amazing occasion. And, and Lord, thank you for making sure that these words of Mary, this song of Mary, the, the original Christmas song, were recorded for us so that 2,000 years later, we can still marvel at the miracle of who you are. And Lord, as we remember who you are, teach us how that we can magnify you and encourage us, Lord, motivate us with your love to love one another, to pray, praise, and give you thanks for all that you are. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Oh,